After rewatching the original Spider-Man trilogy and the two amazing Spider-Man movies in preparation for the mashup extravaganza called No Way Home, I also revisited the first two entries in the franchise starring Tom Holland. How do they fare in direct comparison to the other ones? Hi there, it's Micha. Join me for this review and I will let you know. Part 1 starts directly with a recap of Captain America Civil War, this iteration of Spidey's first appearance. By way of us seeing footage, he shot with his cell phone about his adventure. Ending with him returning home, where Tony Stark asked him to keep it quiet and that they will call him if there is another mission. Don't do anything I would do. And definitely don't do anything I wouldn't do. There's a little gray area in there and that's where you operate. While it is nice to see Tony again, he and Happy really acted like jerks in this one. Clearly just having used Peter with no real contingency plan. Oh. All right. That's not a hug, I'm just grabbing the door for you. All right, kid. Good luck out there. Sure, Tony likes the kid, as we learn, and may have had some plans, which he never really reveals to the teenager. And he lets him keep the valuable suit, but otherwise they ignore his calls and make him feel completely abandoned. I feel like I could be doing more. You know, I'm just curious when the next real mission is going to be. So yeah, just call me back. It's Peter. Parker. Quite early on, in a funny scene where Peter climbs in through his window to his room, dangling from the ceiling, he finds his best friend Ned sitting on the bed waiting for him. You're the Spider-Man from YouTube. Sharing his secret identity is certainly a relief, but Ned has issues keeping that secret, creating some almost disasters and a lot of entertaining scene setups. Can I try the suit on? Badass. The villain emerging in this movie is, as so often, a victim of circumstances. However, this time not by way of an experiment gone wrong, but by commercial reasons. After the events of the first Avengers, construction company owner Adrian Toomes landed a big contract with the city and got deep into debts to expand his operation accordingly. Then Tony Stark and his Department of Damage Control swoops in, leaving Toomes sit on his payments while stealing his promised income. Of course, Stark taking over also secures to salvage all the alien technology lying around so that they not fall into the wrong hands. What's up, guys? Wait a minute. You guys aren't the real Avengers. I can tell Hulk gives it away. Nice thought, but his hands, as we see in Age of Ultron, might also not always be the right ones. And Toom seeing that the guy partially responsible for all the destruction is now profiting from it, doesn't help in that situation. As Adrian already started work for a day, his team already unearthed enough technology to start looking into another venue of income. Arm stealing. This way Spidey finds out about the operation, following bright explosions to a weapon demonstration. Shutting down the operation turns out harder than Peter expected, as Toomes also used technology to create himself a suit capable of flying, like a bulkier Falcon gear. Under the moniker of Vulture, Toomes faces our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man and it makes for some epic fight scenes. All this happens while Peter tries to juggle his private life and high school. And after taking matters into his own hands, as Happy and Tony keep ignoring his calls, he also has to do it without his high-tech suit. But back to basics is sometimes exactly what you need. Oh, come on, Spider-Man! Like expected after the introduction into the MCU in Civil War, the story around the young hero is more light-hearted and easygoing as previous iterations and even some of the MCU properties. As we didn't see his Genesis story like we did the previous franchises, the movie concentrates on developing Peter's character, thankfully, to introduce his friends and to elaborate on his Aunt May. The Genesis story, by the way, is currently in development as an animated prequel show, likely to use Tom Holland's voice could be interesting. It could also establish or extend, after the series What If, on animated properties also fitting into the MCU, which raises the chance of Into the Spider-Verse also becoming a part of it in the future. The actors in this iteration are still technically a bit too old for their roles, but with the main trio being 20 years old at the time of filming, they are at least the closest so far to their supposed age. And look young enough. 
The oldest, by the way, was the actress playing Peter's love interest Liz with 26 years. It was fun to hear Tony say to Peter in the scene where he takes away the suit, I'm nothing without this suit. If you're nothing without this suit, then you shouldn't have it. Priceless coming from him. But as the saying goes, do as I say, don't do as I do. However, it was exactly the thing Peter needed to reaffirm himself as a hero. The acting is great in this film, with especially Michael Keaton stealing the show. Especially one scene was brilliant, very funny, dark and at the same time revealing as hell, as one of his crew tried to blackmail them. You know what? What? They were... I don't know. I can't afford that. Oh. Oh. I thought this was the anti-gravity gun. What? No, that's that one. Showing that he didn't plan to kill him, but that it also didn't face him that much. Another nice gag that even reoccurs in the next movie is the instant kill mode. Peter's costume is way more advanced as he thought. And after Ned hacks the system, all features are available, including an instant kill mode. Would you like me to engage enhanced combat mode? Yeah. Activating instant kill. No, 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 no. I don't want to kill anybody. Deactivating instant kill. Why would the suit even have this? The Avengers, including Tony, don't go for the kill. Unless it is aliens they fight. Hmm. But you get my point. It is funny, but doesn't seem like something that would really exist in that technology. I don't say killing is out of the question, but not as a built-in feature to directly go there. The suit then also talks to Peter, and the suit lady, as he calls her, is voiced by Jennifer Connelly. Hey, suit lady. I kind of feel bad calling you suit lady, you know? What about... Karen? You can call me Karen if you would like. Hey Karen, what else can this suit do? Which is a very nice touch as she is married to Paul Bettany, who of course was voicing Tony Stark's suit and later on played Vision. Another nice touch to anchor the movie in the MCU is to have Captain America do educational videos for the school. Pretty sure this guy's a war criminal now, but whatever, I have to show these videos. It's quite by the state, let's do it. As an end gag, Cap returns in the post credit scene teaching us about the value of patience. Sometimes patience is the key to victory. Sometimes it leads to very little. Though this depends on if you enjoyed that meta joke or not. And you wonder why you waited so long for something so disappointing. How many more of these? The effects were very solid in this movie, but some were very obviously identifiable as CGI. In that regard, the three year older Amazing Spider-Man 2 was a bit better as it had a higher budget. I guess Sony was a bit hesitant with their trust in this new one, but it is only a slight difference. By the way, while re-watching all of the movies, I noticed that we have a Flash Thompson in every iteration, completely different in each version. Joe Mangan Yellow is playing a very one-dimensional version, not his fault, in the first trilogy. And Chris Silka is a more rounded character in the Amazing Spider-Man movies who even ended up being friendly with Peter. In the current movies in the MCU, Flash is not physically bullying Peter, but is a douchey name caller still getting under Peter's skin. All the while being a huge supporter and fan of Spider-Man, without knowing how close his idol is and how he is treating him. By the way, the screenplay was co-written by John Francis Daly, who, fun fact, starred in Freaks and Geeks with James Franco, who had one of his first big breaks with the original Spider-Man trilogy and with Martin Starr, who plays one of Peter's teachers in Homecoming. Daly also starred in the TV show Bones as psychiatrist Sweets, alongside Emily de Chanel, who also had one of the first small roles in the original Spider-Man movie franchise, playing a receptionist. When he asked the producers of Bones to write him out for a while so he could direct the 2015 National Lampoon's vacation sequel slash reboot with Ed Helms, they countered by killing off his character unceremoniously. Something that I still think was a dick move, which ended up being a grim jumping the shark moment for the show. After that, Daly co-wrote this Spidey script and next up for him is directing a big budget reboot of the Dungeons and Dragon movies for Paramount, starring Chris Pine. So I guess it all worked out fine for him in the end. But back to the movie. I really enjoyed it, both the first time around and on the rewatch. It is hard to compare with the other versions, but as I promised to do, here we go. The Tobey Maguire version was great at its time. It still holds up action-wise, but from today's point of view comes across as too sexist, 
using MJ only as a story device and to show her off in the rain in skin tight clothes and such. It is using many comic style elements, which at the time seemed original, but makes it look like the cheesiest iteration now. Still a good watch though. Andrew Garfield in his version is sometimes acting a bit off as Peter, but is spot on in his portrayal as Spidey, especially in the second movie where he perfectly nails the way Spidey talks to villains, bystanders and himself, like he does in the comics, even better than Tom Holland, whose Spidey character is also written very close to it. The overall atmosphere and the bonus of being the main Spidey in the MCU elevates Tom Holland's version and his youth and clumsiness as Peter makes up for a lot. So the first trilogy would take the third place in my book, with a close race for the first place won by Tom Holland's version for being the best Peter, with a close second for Andrew Garfield as being the best Spidey so far. The rest of the details that I want to share contain spoilers, so let's do the rating now before we open the spoiler zone. The movie has basically no major faults, though it also doesn't sport the great and massive highlights other MCU vehicles have, which here almost seems more appropriate at least for the first solo mission of a web slinger. It is not excellent yet, but it is a great one and great fun, so I'm scoring it with 8 out of 10 points. Now if you don't want to get spoiled but enjoyed this video so far, please like it now and share it with your friends. And if you are no subscriber yet, maybe consider changing that. If you also hit the notification bell, you will get a heads up whenever a new video is posted. If you don't mind spoilers or have already watched the movie, please follow me into the spoiler zone. So there was a nice twist that Peter's love interest, Liz, turned out to be Toom's daughter. And after being incarcerated, they relocated, never to be seen again. Though the Vulture will appear in Morbius, another upcoming Sony movie, so maybe his family also makes an appearance? But likely it will just be him. FYI, when I wrote this, Morbius was not in theaters yet. It is now, but I haven't seen it yet, so I have no idea if what I said is true or not. We will find out later, I guess. But let's get back to business. All the while, a girl by the name of Michelle was along for most of a riot, keeping things real and honest in her dry and apropos way to address things. She probably stops staring before it gets creepy, though. Yeah. Too late. You guys are losers. She turns out to prefer to be called MJ. So Peter's MJs across the multiverse don't always turn out to be named Mary Jane. Also in the mid credit scene, we see that the Vulture is keeping Peter's identity a secret. While it is not clear if he wants revenge himself, or is thankful that Peter just captured him and didn't let him die. Considering the point in time I'm writing this, it may even have no consequence at all. But I don't want to spoil future movies. The movie ends with Aunt May coming into Peter's room while he is in costume, cutting off her what the f in the middle of the world, giving us a nice smile and being a great setup for the next movie. How did you like this first solo mission? Which version of Spider-Man is your favorite? Let me know in the comments. Well, so much for now. See you next time and thanks for watching.